I want to, I want to talk to you about uh, leadership and being leaders. So you have, most of you have come away from your other work context to spend three, four years here at college to be developed as leaders, that you might go back out uh, to lead Christian churches uh, for decades, uh, Lord willing, over the next number of years, of course. But I want to wrestle with you just for a short time from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 on what we are as leaders. What is it to be a Christian leader? Uh, what are you? What are we? And I want to offer two thoughts from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, a very well-known passage, of course, that I think kind of exist in a kind of tension. Uh, they sit alongside each other, but they don't necessarily sit easily. And I want to show you, I think, a little bit of how they work together. So how about I briefly pray and we wrestle with this text together. Father, we do ask, please, that you might give us insight and understanding into your word and that, please, by that, by your spirit, you would transform and change us to be the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so what are we? Well, if you come to chapter 3 um, of uh, 1 Corinthians, and make sure I've got the right place, verse 7. Uh, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So he's talking here about Apollos, Paul himself. He says, verse 5, they're only servants through whom you came to believe. I planted, Apollos watered, but God makes it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. What are we as leaders? Not anything. We're only servants. Now, the idea of a servant, of course, is in itself... Um, a place of prestige when you're serving God, but he uses the word only servants to make clear that we're only that. Uh, so his focus is on the humiliation, the humility that comes with that idea and goes on even to say, in comparison to the God who is at work, because of its God being at work, because it's his work, uh, because of that, in comparison to him, we're not even anything. Um, now, of course, he's saying this about himself and Apollos, Imagine what he'd say about us if he met us. He can say of himself that he's nothing. But of course, if he met us, we'd be lower still. Now, welcome to chapel this morning. This is a very inspiring, enthusing message. What are you as leaders? You're nothing. There you are. Um, but it is actually, I think, a cause for great encouragement. Um, we are nothing. We're not anything because God is at work. Because God's at work. It's not up to us. We're not the key. It's God's work, so be encouraged. He gives the growth. It's his task. And in some ways, we're just along for the ride. Um, and I trust that gives rest to your soul. Oh, I'm in a task that's God's task. Um, I think it speaks to our natural human pride. There's no place for pride in Christian ministry because we're only servants. We're not anything in comparison to the God who gives the growth. So we are, therefore, I think, as you come into college and as you come out of college, we're to work hard to put to death a competitive spirit that can exist amongst us. Um, it's born of pride, of course, uh, that kind of pride that compares my work to someone else's work, compares my achievements to someone else's achievements, uh, that wants my ministry to be more successful than another ministry, that can't rejoice in someone else's growth because I want to have that growth, that can't rejoice in the brains of another person who's got all the answers and I don't have the answers, that can't actually thrill to see someone else grow and flourish because I want that place, that hates the fact that people, other people get listened to whenever they make comments, but I don't get listened to when I make my comments, get rid of that competitive spirit that's born of pride. Um, any success we achieve in ministry, and I want to reclaim the word success, actually. Success just means achieving what you set out to achieve. There's nothing wrong with success. It's how we play it, of course. But any success you achieve is only because it's God's work. It's his power, so powerfully at work in us, so praise him. We're only servants. We're not anything. Now, this pride piece, it's interesting, this pride piece, getting rid of it should be easy for Australians because uh, we're, we don't have a celebrity culture. We, we are the cut down the tall poppies, that's who we are. We plant buffalo grass to make sure no pop, uh, poppies grow. Do you know, we, we keep the whole thing flat. That's called Presbyterianism, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
anyway, yeah. Um, it, 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 we make sure that uh, no one climbs above the rest. But here's the thing I've noticed over the decades, and it's terrible to say, right? I know, 40 year old, and I'm still talking about decades, right? But um, here's what I've noticed is that we still bring to our work identity issues. Uh, one of the biggest challenges we find around the place is that it's so easy to turn um, my small thing into a me project, where I want it to bring something to me and my worth and significance. But the very thing we need as leaders to flourish, actually, as leaders, and to build ministries that will grow and reach regions, the very thing we need is a deep appreciation that the work matters more than my part in the work that the work matters more than my part in the work. My job is to die in it that others might live because it's God who gives the growth, I'm merely a servant. And it's that very dynamic that brings the growth, ironically, do you see? Um, we are merely servants, it's his work, we can rightly invest for the good of the whole and lose ourselves in it. And I love that. It's not about us. We're only servants. There's the first piece. But here's the second piece that I think exists in a kind of tension with that first piece. We are only servants, we're nothing, we're not anything. But here's the thing, you are also something. And you are very much important to the work. So important, and here's the piece, so important that your work makes a difference eternally to the destinies of people in your ministries. And there's two steps I want to take you through here to see this. Look at verse 13. Uh, come down there. Um, the, uh, well, look at verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So he's talking here about the final day of judgment, the fire that will test the quality of each person's work. But notice the nuance that the test of the quality of each person's work is actually testing the finished product of their work, the building, verse 14. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If what has been built... So the, the test of your ministry will be what you've built. And if it survives, so you'll receive a reward. What's the thing you built? Well, call, according to Paul in the context, it's the church, the Christian community. That's the resultant work of your labour. Back to verse 9. We are God's workers in his God's service. You are God's field, God's building. What is built? The thing that's tested is the spiritual well-being, the spiritual state of the people gathered as the church. If the people survive judgment, the pastor, minister, receives his reward. If they're lost, he suffers loss. Your eternal experience is tied to the ministry you work in. In a very profound way. And you sense the kind of tension that's emerging here. We are nothing. We're only servants. We're nothing. We're not anything. It's God who gives the growth. And yet, we are critical to the outcome in the spiritual realm of the lives of people we pastor and minister to. Our work makes a difference to the eternal spiritual state of the churches we pastor. If what is built survives, do you see? If we build with shoddy materials, the kind that won't survive, we'll build a community of faith, a community of people that won't stand on Judgment Day, and that will be to our shame. If we build with precious materials, the kind that will survive, we'll build a community that will last to our reward. We're nothing, merely servants, but we're something at the same time. But I said two steps. Let me give you the second step, which is Paul's self-description of himself. <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he, he actually describes himself um, 
as a wise master builder in verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. Now, I'm going to dare talk Greek to you all. It's, uh, th th that little phrase there comes from two Greek words, uh, the word for wisdom, uh, sophos, and architectone. And uh, architectone is, the, is a compound word. I'm not going to look at anyone who understands Greek just to try and keep my way from anyone who lectures. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's the, it's the, uh, I think the NIV is right in translating that second word, master builder. It's not just the word builder, it's master builder. And I think the ESV from memory translates the first word as skillful. And I think that's probably right. Because that little phrase appears a couple of times in the Septuagint and also outside the Bible, um, that phrase exactly, and it has some sense of meaning as a package, skillful master builder. But the use of the word wise there is helpful because it ties you back into chapter 1 and the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God and the person of Christ and so on. So it's nice having the wise word there, but it's also skillful. But all of this is to say, um, Paul didn't just turn up. He didn't just wander around the Mediterranean pulling out his stock sermon. He did what he did with great care. And he commands those who follow him to build with care. And not just to do it with care, but with skill, to do it wisely as a master builder. To have the wisdom to know that there's only one foundation, Christ. But he uses the word, I think, that phrase to suggest more than just that you build on Christ. And here's the point. We are right to fight for deep care with the shape of our message. Of course, it's fundamental and foundation, the foundation you lay, that you understand the things of Christ, you understand the gospel, you get that clear and deeply and profoundly understood. College is important here. The care we are to take, though, is also in how we build. We're to preach Christ and him crucified. We're not to add or subtract. We're to do it in season and out of season so that people are established in him. But I'm offering that Paul means more than just doing that. I'm suggesting any review of his ministry shows deep skill and wisdom of a master builder. Just recently, we went through 2 Corinthians, and we were into chapter 8 at one time. It really struck me how when the Apostle Paul was talking about the collection for the saints and the management that he put in place to ensure that it went well, he paid attention to making sure the right kind of people came with the money and delivered the money to make sure there was all above board. And the people. He, he took great care and skill in the way he organised that piece of his ministry. But his wisdom in preaching... His pastoral wisdom. He, he knew what to say, when to say it, who to say it to, how to backtrack, how to actually come hard, when to go soft, how to actually... He, he, all, 1 and 2 Corinthians and all of that whole package tells you this man was a wise, skillful master builder. The way he delegated, the way he managed things, he built as a skilled master builder. And the implications I want to suggest for us are, are very clear. We are nothing. God gives the growth. We're merely servants. But it also matters how you do that service. We're accountable for the fruit of our work. What is built affects us and our future. We need to learn to do what we do as well as we can do it. We can't just retreat into, he does it so we can just turn up. Your time at college is critical and beyond to learn to be a wise, skillful master builder. Br bring humility to the task. We're only servants. He's the one who gives the growth. It's not a competition. It's his work. But also bring a great desire to learn how to do what you do well. What we do makes a difference into eternity. What we do how we build, how we preach, how we pastor, how we manage and organise makes a difference into eternity. The fruit of our work. It matters that we do it with skill. 
It matters that we learn to be master builders. Don't just turn up. We, we don't just say true words and preach true sermons and pray right prayers. It matters how you do all of that. It matters how you lead and care for people and engage. It makes a difference. Now, I think this kind of stuff can be hard to hear in the context of a tough ministry where you don't feel like a master builder. Many people in ministry feel like imposters. They feel like they're not, this is, you know, I'm not able to be that person. And it can be tough to hear all of this that actually you're making a difference eternally and it's actually be bound, tied back to you and what you've done and how you've done it. It can be very hard, the pressure that comes. And if you feel all of that, you're understanding what's being said. Brothers and sisters, we are not doing something trivial or simple like brain surgery. Do you know what I mean? We are doing something far more serious and complex than brain surgery. So we, we are dealing with eternal destinies. We, we ought to be working to skill up far more than the most competent and capable people in our society. This is not just the job you get when you couldn't find the other job. This is far more demanding and far more consequential. We need clarity around what materials we bring to the task, the foundation of Jesus. What exactly that looks like, what exactly is the message we're meant to share. We need all of that clarity. But then we need skill about how to apply that message, how to preach that message, when and where, how to run church, how to do the challenges, how to rebuke and correct, when to rebuke, when to correct, how often. All of that takes incredible skill. How to manage people so that the work flourishes. You need to learn these things, to how to be an overseer. So here's the thing, and I'm about done. Pay attention while you're going through college. Don't take these few years for granted. Don't skip things. Don't turn up to lectures and watch YouTubes while the lecture's happening. Don't watch basketball during lectures. Focus on what's being said, though you may have heard it before. Think deeper about what's being said. Make the most of these few months. You won't get them back. Don't be distracted. This hour that you have, make the most of it and the next and the next. And when you rest, rest well. So you can get back into it and do it well. Go as deep as you can. If you've heard it before, read more. Wrestle with other things. The challenges out there in pastoral ministry are vast. The nuances, the complexities, the different people you engage with. Society and where it's going, the subtle ways it's gripped us. And if you don't see the problems in social context now, you, you will be lost out there. Drink deeply of the rock so that you have the raw materials. Make it your pursuit in these few years. And then pay attention to how to do ministry. Become a skilled master builder. Don't buy into the thinking that because I'm merely a servant and am nothing, he gives the growth, it doesn't matter how I do it. This isn't brain surgery. It's far more significant. What you bring to the work makes a difference for people's eternal destinies. Feel the pressure of that. Who is equal to such a task? None of us on our own. But thanks be to God, he gives the grace that we need to do the task. No other job is like this. And our proper disposition towards it is humility and great care. <coughs> Let me pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we, we are conscious of our frailty, our inadequacies. And we ask, please, that you might grow in us all that we need to do what we do as well as we can. Please give us a, a, a conviction about the importance of these things, a growing and deepening conviction, and give us a great awareness of the need to skill up, to become master builders. And in it all, give us a great sense that it's your work, it's your gospel. We have been given such a precious gift Help us be faithful to it, we ask in Jesus' name.